Welcome to Tanakh Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live out of Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of where Rabbi Cross examines the New Testament with Rabbi Michael the Man Skoback. Welcome back. How are you this beautiful day? <laughs> you still, you still have me sounding like a wrestler, like <laughs> Haystacks Calhoun. <laughs> uh, All right. The hardest part of the, hard, the hardest part about me doing that was dropping the other part. <laughs> I, I know, I know, I remember the other part. <laughs> oh goodness gracious! All right, good deal, man. I tell you what, it turns out uh, Mark chapter one seems to be quite the hit. Um, it's got getting a lot of traction on in YouTube land. And, um, I, you know, something I never knew until later on. In fact, I didn't even know this until probably four years ago. And, of course, I've been doing Tanakh Talk now for going on nine years. Uh, this is 2014, November. Of course, you and I have been doing this for seven, right, roughly. Um, but it wasn't until about four years ago, maybe, that I was even aware of the – maybe five – that I was even aware that uh, Mark uh, had – some added verses in, I mean, it's one Ooh, thing. That, don't steal the thunder. We're going to get there. Oh my gosh. Okay. Okay. Good, good, good. Okay. I'm, I'm excited. I can't wait for that part. That's going to be so cool. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> no spoiler well, hopefully alerts. Hopefully we'll have some goodies before we get there. <laughs> I'm sure you will. I mean, like, like I said, last one in chapter one was pretty, pretty eye-opening for sure. All right. Well, Rabbi, take it away and I'll just, <laughs> I'll do my job and hush. <laughs> okay. So, Chapter 2 in Mark actually continues with something that really is quite problematic um, from the end of chapter 1 that I didn't even get a chance to mention last week. Um, So let me just make mention of the very end of chapter 1 from Mark. So the chapter ends basically with... uh, a report about Jesus's alleged healing of a leper, someone with leprosy. And after he heals him, he warns this fellow not to speak about it to anyone, just so to, you know, keep it in the vault. And the very last verse in chapter one says that this fellow went around blabbing. <laughs> he went, he couldn't keep his mouth shut and he was blabbing about the healing And so the chapter ends by saying that the news spread to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city. He had to stay in unpopulated areas and they were coming to him from everywhere. That's the very last verse in chapter one. So chapter two basically continues along the same lines and tells us that when word got out that Jesus was back home in Kafar Nachum, in English it's written Kaparnaum, um, but it's Kafar Nachum, the, 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 the farm or the uh, sort of the settlement of Nachum. And when the word got out that he was back home, it says that crowds gathered and there was no room to bring anyone into the front door, that people were crowding around the front door and you couldn't get into the house. So there was someone who was paralytic, someone who was paralyzed. And in order to bring him into the house to, for Jesus to heal, it says they had to remove the roof of the house. And they lowered this paralytic man down into the house on a pallet. And what's interesting is that throughout the Gospels, we see, and I mentioned this last week, we see a constant refrain, a constant focus on Jesus' alleged healings and the numerous references as he speaks about these miraculous healings that Jesus is working. So the Gospels speak often about the mushrooming popularity because of these healings you can imagine right words getting out that you can go to this guy and he'll get rid of your gout and so everybody's showing up so for example we'll see next week um actually no we're going to see uh later on here in chapter two 
in verse 13. It says, he went out again by the seashore and all the people were coming to him, right? It doesn't say a, a handful of people. It makes clear that it, there's a massive number of people that are coming to him at the seashore, all the people, it says. And then when we go to chapter three, we'll be covering chapter three next week. So let's, let's just look now at verses seven through 10 in chapter three. It says, Jesus withdrew to the sea with his disciples and a great multitude from Galilee followed and also from Judea and from Jerusalem and from Idumea and beyond the Jordan and the vicinity of Tyre and Sidon. A great number of people heard of all that he was doing and came to him. And he told his disciples that a boat should stand ready for him because of the crowd so that they would not crowd him for he had healed many, with the result that all those who had afflictions pressed around him in order to touch him. So you have this, and this is repeated many, many times throughout the Gospels, that Jesus was working these miraculous healings and other wonders, and as a result of that, his popularity grew and grew and grew, and he was followed by huge crowds everywhere. So the problem is that, and it should be obvious what the problem is, that Christians have forever been invested in trying to identify Jesus with the suffering servant that is described in Isaiah chapter 53. However, if you study Isaiah, let's just look briefly at chapter 53 let's say verses two and three. So there the prophet says that he has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. Meaning that the, the servant is described as someone who had no eye appeal and you wouldn't even want to pay attention to him. And then Isaiah goes on to say, that he was despised and rejected of men. He was despised and forsaken of men. Like one from whom men hide their face. And he was despised and we did not esteem him. So Isaiah describes the servant of the Lord in chapter 53 as someone who's not winning any popularity contests. Isaiah describes the servant of the Lord as someone that people turn their faces away from him, and as someone who is despised and hated and rejected. And the problem here is that the Gospels are continually painting Jesus. Like, I remember when I was in high school, we were studying this, uh, it was a play that became a movie back then. It was called Jesus Christ Superstar. And that's basically what you have in the Gospels, this portrait of someone who is doing miracles left and right, and as a result, he's the most famous guy in all of Israel at the time. People are crowding around. He can't even get into his house. He can't even go into a city. So it's very hard to square the portrait, the, the portrayal of Jesus in the Gospels with the portrayal of the suffering servant of God in Isaiah chapter 53, it's like trying to force a square peg into a round hole. It just doesn't really work. Now, when we move on to verse five here, it says that Jesus says to this paralytic that was lowered into the house, Jesus says to him, your sins are forgiven. Now, this is problematic for a number of reasons. Um, I just wanted to focus on one initially, which is that Christians beat a very steady drum that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness. That's actually a verse in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, that is mistakenly attributed to Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. 
But this is one of the major claims that Christians make. They're constantly throwing this, this into the face of Jewish people. They're saying to Jewish people today, how do you get your sins forgiven? There's no, no blood. You have no sacrifices. You have no blood. And without the shedding of blood, there cannot be any forgiveness. There cannot be any atonement. So what happened, as we know, is that Christianity transformed the biblical concept of a messianic king who reigns during a utopian period of time in the distant future, that was transformed. Jesus obviously did not fulfill the biblical criteria of the Messiah. Jesus did not fulfill one messianic prophecy from the Hebrew scriptures. He did not reign as a king. He certainly did not reign during a utopian age. And so the Christian concept of Messiah had to basically undergo a, a, a remake. It had to go through a, a, a you know, 2.0. And basically the concept of the Messiah in Christian terms became someone who comes to die as a sacrifice to atone for the sins of the world. But the problem is that Jesus had not died yet at this point. And so if the, if the means by which people's sins can be forgiven is that they can be covered by the blood of Jesus, there was no blood of Jesus at this point. This was about three years before his crucifixion. So the question is, on the basis of what is this paralytic person being forgiven here? Jesus just waves his hand and says, your, your sins are forgiven, but how does that happen? There's no blood. And again, the Christian insists that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. So it's interesting that the verse here doesn't give us or doesn't give the Christian the kind of answer that would be convenient. Meaning the verse doesn't say that Jesus saw this man's faith doesn't say that Jesus saw the faith of this paralytic man. It says that he saw the faith of the crowd, that Jesus saw their faith. And then he turns to this person and says that your sins are forgiven. That may have been a way of dealing with this, could have said that maybe the person was forgiven on the basis of the fact that he, he had faith and the faith may have indicated his Repentance. We know that in Scripture, it never tells us in Scripture that forgiveness of sins and atonement for sins is connected to faith alone. The idea of just someone having faith in God, for example, that is not something that is able to bring about forgiveness from sins. It might be a prerequisite, meaning that before a person will engage in repentance and teshuvah, of course, they have to have faith. They have to have faith in the God that's going to forgive them when they repent. So faith, obviously, is part of the repentance process. Repentance means turning back, teshuvah, to return. You're returning to God. You're turning away from your sin. You're returning to God. So obviously, faith is part of it. But faith is not the entire process of atonement and forgiveness. The person has to regret their sin and they have to resolve not to repeat their sin and to return to God and ask for forgiveness, etc. So it's very hard to understand in this little piece here how Jesus forgave this person's sins. Now, this incident is used by Christians to bolster the claim of Jesus' divinity. Meaning, if you look at verse 7 in this chapter, so in verse 7, the scribes are quoted as saying, he is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? So the implication is that if Jesus here is forgiving sins, he must be God. That seems to be the implicit argument. But it's pretty clear, I believe, that in the first century, the followers of Jesus did not see him. They did not believe that he was God. They didn't see Jesus as God in the flesh who was walking among them. And we know that 
They didn't worship Jesus. Prayer was never directed to Jesus. That's pretty clear when we study the, the all of the writings, really, of the Christian scriptures and the history at the time. Um, if you go back, you know, to our discussion of Acts chapter 5, so we know that, you know, in the story that's told there, they bring the disciples of Jesus to Gamliel, who was the head of the Sanhedrin at the time, and they are, are whoever brings them to Gamliel wants to basically beat them up or kill them, and Gamliel says, leave them alone, they're doing nothing wrong. If what they believe is true, you can't stop it. If what they believe is not true, it'll fall apart by itself. But had the followers of Jesus been people who were worshiping him as God, he wouldn't have said they're doing nothing wrong, leave them alone. That would have been idolatry. We have many, many other proofs we've given that show that in the first century, the followers of Jesus did not believe that he was God. They did not worship him as God. And it's pretty clear from the gospel accounts that his family did not think of him as God. They didn't worship him as God, his own immediate family. In our study of the Greek scriptures, when we went through the rest of the epistles and the letters, etc., it seems pretty clear that neither Paul nor the writers of the other epistles and letters Neither of them believed that Jesus was God. They probably had an elevated view of who Jesus was, perhaps an intermediary to God, but there was no concept that Jesus was God. And the idea only really began to develop in the second and third centuries. So when we see a passage in the Christian writings that doesn't really fit into this narrative, when you see a, a passage like this, passage here in Mark chapter 2, where, again, Jesus allegedly says to this person, your sins are forgiven, and the Christian argument is, well, no one could say that except for God. So we have to think about the actual meaning of the passage. You just can't take it at face value. And it's far from clear to me, at least, that Jesus actually says all the things that the gospel writers put into his mouth, meaning that, not that my opinion is worth that much, but my understanding when I read the Gospels is that these were not contemporaneous notes that were written down at the time that Jesus spoke. These are documents that are composed. Mark, they assume, was written about 40 years after Jesus was crucified. So we're talking about documents that are written really later on and I don't necessarily accept the orthodox claim that these are direct quotes from Jesus. Jesus didn't write anything down. And my assumption is that the writers are putting words into his mouth. But for the sake of argument, let's assume that Jesus said to this person, his sins are forgiven. So I don't think that kind of statement has to mean and has to be understood to be a statement that Jesus is God. So let's just look at a few other possibilities. Um, he may have thought, Jesus may have thought that, or the writers may have thought that he sometimes received prophetic revelations. Meaning if you see Jesus as a prophet, so it's possible that as a prophet, he received, I don't believe he was a prophet, but again, if you assume he was a prophet and that he could have received prophetic revelation, so God could have told Jesus that this person's sins are forgiven. That wouldn't make Jesus into a God just as much as Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel and any of the prophets were not God because they relayed messages that were given to them by God. Another possibility is, a more psychological possibility, is that Jesus may have sized up this person and felt that he sincerely repented, meaning that, you know, we don't have the whole story here when we read Mark chapter 2. There was obviously interaction between Jesus and this paralytic man, and it could be that he sized the person up in their interaction and felt 
that the person had re has sincerely repented. And therefore, he assumed that the person's sins were forgiven. Because again, when a person repents sincerely, their sins are forgiven, as the Bible says. A third possibility is that the writer seems to say or believe in verse 10 that God gave Jesus the authority to forgive sins. So again, this would be similar to saying that Jesus was a prophet who heard from God, but you don't have to be God to be given authority by God to do certain things. So the writer here, or Jesus himself, may have believed that God gave him the authority to forgive sins. That doesn't mean he is God. So again, you have to be careful when you read these kinds of passages not to read too much into it. Because again, you have to, as we say, scripture has to be understood in the context of scripture. And to me, it's very clear that Jesus was not seen as God in that first century. And so when you get an ambiguous statement like your sins are all forgiven, that doesn't automatically mean that Jesus is God or Jesus thought he was God or the writers even thought he was God. What's interesting is that after the alleged healing of the paralytic in verse 12, no one praises Jesus, which is interesting, right? The verse 12 says that they praised and they glorified God. They didn't praise and glorify Jesus after this healing. So that's an important little detail. In verse 17, it's interesting, we come across an interesting little scenario here. In the previous verse, in verse 16, the scribes of the Pharisees, now that's it's an interesting expression because usually in the Gospels you'll get the scribes and the Pharisees. Here it's the scribes of the Pharisees. And it says that the scribes of the Pharisees were questioning why Jesus was eating with sinners and tax collectors. Why was he doing that? Apparently, it wasn't the normal practice for, let's say, rabbis or religious leaders or people that were very spiritual to eat with sinners and tax collectors who were kind of sinner for many reasons. Number one, people that were on a higher spiritual level generally practiced the laws of ritual purity and impurity. And people that were sinners were not careful about being ritually impure or ritually pure. And so it would have been more difficult to share a meal with people that were not careful about their state of ritual purity. And also people that were sinners were not normally people that were going to have deep conversations with you about spiritual things. There were many reasons why this was not normally what was done. And so they questioned him. And Jesus says, it's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So this passage as well is somewhat problematic in light of the church's insistence that there is no one who is righteous. This is almost an axiom of Christianity. Um, you see this, for example, in the book of Romans chapter three, verses 9 through 12, that there is no one who is righteous. No, not one. Now, it's based upon a misreading of passages in Tanakh, for example, Psalm 14. But this is the clear teaching of Paul in Romans, that there is no one who is righteous. No, not one. And it seems to be, again, an assumption that is made throughout the Christian literature that it's impossible to be righteous. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 21, so it says that if you could be righteous through following the laws of the Torah, then Jesus died in vain. Who needs Jesus if you're able to be righteous without him? So this seems to be almost an axiom of the church, that you cannot be righteous. And therefore, what does it mean when Jesus says here, that I haven't come to the righteous. Who is he talking about if it's impossible to be righteous? It's interesting that in the Tanakh, we see the idea that 
everyone sins. That's true. Tanakh says this in many places. In the book of Eov and Job, there are two places which speak about anyone born of a woman sins. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 20, there isn't a righteous person on the earth who only does good and never sins. In Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16, a righteous man falls down seven times and gets up. So in the Tanakh, we see that basically to be human means that you're going to mess up. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to sin. The word sin itself in Hebrew means to make a mistake, to err. So the idea that everyone sins is a biblical concept. But to say that that means that no one can be righteous is absurd because there's no assumption in the Tanakh that if you sin, that sort of makes it impossible to be righteous. The Tanakh teaches that even righteous people sin. What makes them righteous is that, as it says in Proverbs 24, 16, that they get up after they've sinned, meaning that they learn from their mistakes, they grow from their mistakes, and they improve. They use their mistakes as a way of getting up and becoming bigger people. But it doesn't mean that once you've sinned, you can no longer be considered someone who's righteous. That's really the mistake of Christianity. The mistake of Christianity is to assume that someone who sins can never be considered righteous. Now, it's interesting to know what exactly Jesus would have said to these sinners that he's dining with. And we don't know. Here in Mark, it doesn't say. But if you go to the parallel passage in Luke chapter 5, verse 32, so it says that he calls them, because all it says here in Mark is that I, I, I call, I didn't come to call the righteous, I came to call the sinner. In Luke 5, 32, it says he called them to repentance. He calls them to repentance, which interestingly is, as we've seen, we saw it last week in chapter one, this was the message of John the baptizer. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand, meaning that the message at that time, and it's very possible to see Jesus as a disciple of John the baptizer. In last week's chapter, he goes down to the Jordan to be baptized by John the baptizer. Um, when we will study this passage about Jesus going to the Jordan, it's very interesting. We're not going to discuss it now. Maybe we'll get to it when we go to Luke and John. But the story is really rewritten in later versions where they don't like this idea that Jesus seems subordinate to John the baptizer. In any event, it seems at least from Mark, which is considered the earliest of the Gospels, that Jesus is basically a disciple of sorts of John the baptizer. And he has the same message. He's calling on people to repent, to turn away from their sins. And so this idea that he would basically go not to the righteous, but he's going to the sinners and calling them to repentance. This would be consistent, not just with John the baptizer, it would be consistent with any teacher in Judaism that you basically are sent to reprove people, to help people see if they're going in the wrong direction, to get them to realize they need to change and to change. And it's possible to change. Again, Pauline Christianity accepted the idea, the fallacious idea, that we cannot change. We cannot be good. We cannot improve. We cannot become righteous. And therefore, we need God to kill his son for us. We can't do it. We're not able to do it. Again, Paul says in Galatians, if you could do it, then who needs Jesus to die for your sins? If you could repent of your sins, if you would be able to repent and change and become a different person, you don't need Jesus. So again, the mistaken assumption of Christianity later on was that it's not possible to repent. It's impossible. And that's why Jesus had to die for your sins. But here in the beginning of Mark, you see that there was an understanding that people can repent. And that's exactly what John the baptizer and Jesus was doing. According to these stories, they were calling on people to repent. Now, just tell a very, very cute short 
vignette. Um, I just got back uh, two weeks ago from a conference of the Union of Messianic Jewish Congregations, the UMJC, and I've been going for over 30 years to this conference. And I remember many years ago, I think it may have been the conference they had in, in Minneapolis, um, I was challenged by a group of maybe four or five of the co people that were at the conference came to me and they were sort of aggressive and they said, like, what are you doing here? So I, I put on a smile and I basically quoted Jesus and I said, my place is with the sinners, not with the righteous. And that's what I was doing there. Um, so we're going to go on now to chapter to, to verses 18 to 20. And it's interesting that in this little portion, 18 to 20, so it says the students of John, which means the students of John the baptizer and the Pharisees, they fasted, they would fast. And they asked Jesus why his students didn't fast. It's interesting, by the way, they don't ask Jesus why he's not fasting. It's interesting. If Jesus wasn't fasting, they would have asked him, why aren't you fasting? In any event, they're asking him why your students are not fasting. Now, it's not clear from this alone what kind of fasting this is referring to. There are different kinds of fasts. For example, there were private fasts that people undertook as part of the process of repentance and spiritual purification. You see that, for example, in the book of Jonah, chapter 3, verse 7, that the people of Nineveh fasted as part of their repentance process. And it's unlikely that this is what was meant here in this passage, because as many Christians do up until this very day, many Christians engage in this kind of fasting. They will fast as a way of purifying themselves spiritually and as part of their repentance process. So it's unlikely that when the students of John and the Pharisees came to ask Jesus why his students weren't fasting, that they were referring to these kinds of private fasts undertaken for personal purification and repentance. However, there were public fasts at that time, and these public fasts commemorated the destruction of the first temple in Jerusalem. And you see a listing of these fasts in the prophet Zechariah, in Zechariah chapter 8, verse 19. He lists four of these fasts. He speaks about the fast of the fourth, the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth. So what are these referring to? So the fast of the fourth means the fast day in the fourth month. Again, the first month in the Hebrew calendar is the month of Nisan in the spring. That's the month of Passover. The fourth month from Nisan is Tammuz. And on the 17th day of Tammuz, there's a fast. And that fast commemorates the time when the walls of Jerusalem were breached by the Babylonians. Before the Babylonians destroyed the temple, they breached the walls. They first were able to breach the walls on the 17th day of Tammuz. Again, that's the fourth month. And then Zechariah speaks about the fast of the fifth. And that's the month, the fifth month is Av the month of Av that we're in right now. And the ninth of Av, the ninth day of Av, was the day on which the temple was actually destroyed. So they breached the walls on the 17th day of the fourth month, and they destroyed the temple on the ninth day of the fifth month. It just turns out, in Jewish history, the second temple by the Romans was destroyed on that very same day, on the 9th of Av in the year 70. But again, Zechariah here is writing way before the second temple is destroyed. He's speaking about the fast of the 5th, commemorating on the ninth day in the 5th month, the destruction of the temple.
And then he mentions the fast of the seventh. Now, the seventh month is the month of Tishrei. That's the month of the Jewish New Year. Rosh Hashanah is the first day of Tishrei. Uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, is on the tenth day of Tishrei. But there was a fast on the third day of Tishrei, right after Rosh Hashanah, right after the New Year. And this commemorates, it's called Som Gedalia, the Fast of Gedalia. Gedalia was the governor of the land of Israel, basically the, the, the province of Judea. The northern ten tribes are already exiled, but what, was, what remained after the destruction of the temple by the Babylonians, there was a small remnant of a Jewish community that remained in Israel. Not every single uh, Jew went to Babylon. They weren't every, it wasn't 100% exile. There was a small community that remained, and the governor was Gedalia ben Achikam. And we read in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 41, that he was assassinated. And with the assassination of Gedalia ben Achikam, that community, that small community that was left in Judea, that fell apart. And basically, many people went down to live in Egypt. But it was really the end of the Jewish community in Judea at that time. And that's the fast on the seventh month, the fast of the seventh month, the third day of the seventh month, which is called the fast of Gedalia. And then Zechariah speaks about the fast of the tenth, which is the tenth month. And that's the month of Tevet. And this is called the fast of Asara B'Tevet, the 10th day in the month of Tevet. And we see, if you go to the second book of Kings, second Kings chapter 25, verse one, it says that on that day, on the 10th day of the 10th month, Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon, began to lay siege to Jerusalem. So what you see is interesting. The siege of Jerusalem begins on the 10th day of the 10th month. So it continues to the 11th month, the 12th month, and then the next year begins. First month, second month, third month, fourth month. And in the fourth month, um, so in the fourth month, what you have is the breaching of the walls as we saw on the 17th day of the fourth month. So these are all fast days that were instituted. And it's interesting, they were not biblical fasts. They were instituted by the sages, but they're confirmed by the prophets. You see that the sages had the authority to institute these kinds of fasts. And the prophet describes these fasts, but he says, if you read this verse in Again, Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 8, verse 19, he says that these days will become days of joy and gladness and feasting. It's going to happen in the future. When is it going to happen? Obviously, he's referring to the messianic future, when things are now at peace and everything is back to where it should be. So these days will become days of gladness and joy and feasting. So it seems, it seems that what's happening here in Mark chapter 2, verses 18 to 20, is that since the followers of Jesus believed that he was the Messiah, they no longer fasted. That's what seems to be going on, right? That, that, that the students of John and the Pharisees are still fasting on these public fast days, but this is why the students of Jesus were no longer fasting, because in their mind, the Messiah had come, and these days are going to be transformed and no longer observed as fast days. And right after this little passage about the fasting, you have in verses 21 and 22, the parables of sewing new unshrunk cloth patches onto an old garment, and the parable of putting new wine into old wineskins, two parables right after the other. And many Christians take these parables as making the antinomian point, 
that the new gospel of grace can't be contained within the old covenant of law. And that basically the way classically Christians have understood this chapter is that the law is done away with, that we're no longer following these fasts anymore and these parables of the new unshrunk cloth which cannot go on an old garment and putting new wine into an old wine skin, which doesn't make any sense. It says you have to put new wine into a new wine skin. So it's classically Christians have taken these parables and this story of the fasting, again, as stories showing that there's a new sheriff in town and that the old ways are no longer relevant and no longer going to be observed. But there are two problems with this passage, with these two verses here in, in uh, chapter 2, verses 21 and 22. I think they're significant. The first problem is that if you understand this as a polemic against the observance of the Torah, so how do you square it with all of the passages where Jesus affirms the Torah and the observance of the Torah. We remember we covered this back in Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, right? I say to you, I've not come to do away with the law, but to fulfill the law, and therefore anyone that teaches people to observe the least of these commandments is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and anyone who teaches people not to observe the least of these commandments is the least in the kingdom of heaven. And then later on, we see the story where the young person comes to Jesus and says, good teacher, what can I do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus says, why do you call me good? There's no one good but God. And if you want to inherit eternal life, keep the commandments. And many other places where it's clear that Jesus taught the importance of keeping the commandments of the Torah. And where we see that even into the second century, the Jewish believers in Jesus observed the Torah. So how do you say all of a sudden that in this one isolated passage of just, and these are not direct teachings, these are parables that Jesus all of a sudden is preaching against the observance of the Torah. That's one problem here. The second problem is what is the connection between these two parables and the previous verses about fasting and not doing so when the groom is here, right? We said when the groom is not here, you can fast. But now that the groom is here, you can fast. And when the groom will be taken away, you'll go back to fasting. There doesn't seem to be a clear connection between these two passages. So to me, the simplest resolution is that it's simply continuing, it's continuing along the same lines, meaning that these two parables of the sewing of a new unshrunken cloth patch on an old garment and pouring new wine into an old wineskin, it's basically following right on the heels of the story of Jesus' disciples not fasting on these public fasts. And it's not, these passages are not a general repudiation of Torah observance. It's not a general repudiation of, because it's impossible to say that when repeatedly Jesus teaches the importance of observing the Torah, and we see that's exactly what his disciples did. It's so interesting that in the book of Acts, just as an example, you see that there's a whole argument about what they should do with Gentiles who want to join their movement. Are we going to make them get circumcised and observe the laws of the Torah or not? Do they have to keep the Torah laws or not? Now, if they themselves, if these Jewish disciples were not keeping the Torah, why would they have debated what non-Jews should do that are coming into the movement? There wouldn't be a, a debate about what non-Jews should have to do that were going to come into their movement. No one was keeping the Torah, if, that's the, if that was the reality. So it's obvious that since they were debating what they should impose upon non-Jews coming into the movement, whether they should make them keep the Torah or not, it's obvious that they themselves were keeping the Torah. Otherwise, the whole discussion would have been absurd. So it seems to me that these stories here, towards the end of chapter two, they're not a general repudiation 
of Torah observance, but it's focused. It's focused on their belief that the new reality of having the Messiah in their midst would necessarily mean an adjustment has to be made when the law doesn't apply anymore. And so, for example, public fasts commemorating the destruction of the temple, which Zechariah himself said, well, I'm not going to apply in the messianic age. So for these people who believed the Messiah had come, so that would be limited to those kinds of laws that were not relevant to those who believed they were living in the messianic age. So the next passage, which is really the end of the chapter, is another passage that, again, has been used classically by Christians to prove that the Torah has been done away with. And that's the passage where um, Jesus is challenged by the Prussian, by the Pharisees. We always have to remember, by the way, he's not being challenged by the Pharisees as if the, all of the Pharisees came together, you know, and gathered at this spot. There were thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands. According to Josephus, they were the largest group among the Jewish people. So it doesn't mean the Pharisees. It means some people who were Pharisees. That's, that's what happened. You have to be careful when you read these passages. So there were some Pharisees that challenged Jesus. And again, they said, why are your, your disciples plucking grains on the Sabbath? Now, again, it's interesting, just like with the fasting, they don't challenge Jesus. They don't say to Jesus, why are you plucking grains on the Sabbath? They didn't catch him, but they are questioning why his disciples are plucking grains on the Sabbath. So Jesus basically says that, look, you know, think about what King David did with his companions when they were hungry. They went into the tabernacle. Jesus says in the times of Abiyasar, the high priest, actually the story in Tanakh was not Abiyasar, it was Achimelech, but this is, you know, a detail. And Jesus says, and what did they do when they went into the tabernacle? They ate consecrated bread, which was normally permitted only to the priests. And they ate it. And Jesus concludes his little discussion by saying, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So again, centuries of Christians have taken this little vignette, this little story to prove that with the advent of Jesus, the law has been done away with. The Sabbath is no longer to be observed. You don't have to worry about it, etc. And this is really a misreading of the entire chapter. The assumption is, again, when you think about how they misread it, it's very hard to understand their misreading. Their assumption is that this is what Jesus is saying, that just like David broke the law, David ate things that were not permissible. So we are not paying attention to the law either. That seems to be the way Christians read the story, right? Jesus is saying basically you know, if it was good for King David, it's good for us. And the problem is, why would you have thought for a moment that King David was doing something inappropriate? Now, again, it's true that normally non-priests were not allowed to eat the consecrated bread in the tabernacle. But that's the whole point of the story. That's the whole point of what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is not making a speech that the Torah has been done away with. Let's analyze just a little bit about what's going on here. First of all, they challenge Jesus and they say, why are your disciples plucking grain on the Sabbath? Now, if Jesus, for example, was someone who rejected the Torah Shabbat al-Peh, if he had rejected the oral law, Jesus would have responded to the Pharisees, to the Prussian here, by saying, who says it's wrong to do that? Where is there a prohibition in the Torah against taking 
a, a, a head of grain, and this was called, they would do this, it's called molalin malilot. They, you would rub the head of grain between your fingers and you'd be able to eat it. So he could have, and, and according to the oral Torah, that's not allowed on the Sabbath. Now, what what seems to be prohibited on the Sabbath is reaping and harvesting your fields, right? I mean, to get a tractor and to, to harvest your whole field, that would not be appropriate on the Sabbath. But for a person to, you know, go in the field and pluck a head of grain and to rub it between his fingers and eat it, that's not harvesting your field. And yet the oral law said that you shouldn't do that either. And so what Jesus could have done if he didn't accept the oral Torah would have been to say, what are you people talking about? What's wrong with them plucking the heads of grain on the Sabbath? But he doesn't. It's very clear that he accepts the idea that this is a prohibited activity. But he doesn't say that they're doing it because the Torah is no longer binding. That's not what his answer is. He says, listen, what happened in the story of King David when he and his followers, he and his, and his army, basically, his soldiers, went into the tabernacle and they ate the, the showbread, they ate the consecrated bread. But when you study that story in the Tanakh, it says they were hungry. That's why they ate it, meaning there was nothing else to eat. And in a situation where there is nothing else to eat, this is considered dangerous. You're not supposed to starve to death. So he basically gives, Jesus gives what you could call a rabbinic answer to this question. Are you, are you curious as to why my disciples are doing this on the Sabbath? It's because they have no other food. They're starving. And when it comes to danger to human life, danger to human health, it's permissible to do such an activity. And this is basically found in the Talmud itself, in Tractate Menachot, 96a, when there's a danger to human life, the Sabbath is overcome. It's superseded by the requirement of protecting your health. And that's why David was not doing anything. And his men, they were not doing anything wrong, meaning that this was what you call in modern English an exception to the rule. There's a rule. Normally, you don't eat the consecrated bread. But if it's because there's no other food to eat and you're starving, then the rule is superseded by the importance of protecting your health. And the same thing, Jesus is saying this in response to the Pharisees here. That's why my students are basically plucking these grains on the Sabbath. And Jesus quotes basically from the Talmud. Jesus says the Sabbath was made for man and man is not made for the Sabbath. That's from Tractate Yoma. 85b. It's a rabbinic teaching that basically we're supposed to observe the laws of the Torah, but when it comes to human life, saving a human life supersedes the observance of the Torah, except in three cases. So, for example, you would not be allowed to murder someone to save your own life. If someone put a gun to your head and says to you, kill that person over there or I'll kill you, you're not allowed to kill that innocent person. The Talmud asks rhetorically, is your blood redder than their blood? So you cannot kill someone, you cannot murder someone to save you. You could obviously overcome and kill, if necessary, the person threatening you. But you cannot murder an innocent person to save your life. You cannot worship idols to save your life. So if you have a gun put to your head, and are told to worship idols, you are not allowed to do that at the risk of your own life, and to engage in sexually prohibited activities like adultery or incest, etc. Aside from those three cases, we violate the Torah. If you're, if you're sick, you will eat on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, but normally we fast. And if your life is in danger or someone, for example, a woman's about to give birth and you have to get to the hospital, you jump into a cab, you go to the hospital on the Sabbath. So that's the idea that the Sabbath was made for man, meaning that we take precedence when it comes to our life over the observance of the Sabbath, not that we were made for the Sabbath and we have to give our, up our life 
to observe the Sabbath. So it's interesting that this story is used by Christians to prove that Jesus has done away with the law, when if you read it carefully, it proves the exact opposite. Okay, that's chapter two, or at least a short a short uh, synopsis of chapter two. All right. And God willing, next time we meet, we will go further into chapter three. Baruch Hashem. Well, that's great. Well, it definitely stirred up a lot of awesome chat and uh, look forward to... Uh, do you ever go back and rewatch these to see how, what the people are talking about in the chat box? It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> a lot of smart folk out should there. Should I should I do that? You, yeah, my, actually, if you interact with them, you, you'll probably increase your viewer base. <laughs> so that's all good. That's all good. So, guys, thank you all for tuning in. It's been a great, great show, uh, Rabbi. Uh, I really appreciate your time and dedication. You're amazing. We love you. And uh, I, I truly don't know anybody that uh, that can dissect the New Testament like you. I mean. Uh, there's like Rabbi Singer is one of the best is probably the best counter missionary out there. But as far as far as word for word dissecting the New Testament, this is, this is just a beautiful work. I really appreciate your time. Great to be here with you, and God bless you. Thank you. See you guys. We'll see you uh, tonight at 7 p.m. If all goes well, take care. Bye. Hello, my dear friends. Hope this message finds you well. If you like the way this channel is going and the channel has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel by going to the website tanaktalk.com. T-A-N-A-C-H-T-A-L-K dot com. Thank you once again for your time and for supporting Tanakh Talk. Shalom.